Uh, welcome. My name is John Bykovsky. I'm the president of the American Association of Individual Investors, and I'll be acting as the moderator tonight. And I'm really excited about tonight's presentation. Uh, we're joined here with uh, by Paul Merriman, and he's a nationally recognized authority on a range of topics, mutual funds, index investing, asset allocation, uh, buy and hold strategies, active management strategies. And of course, as members of the association, you know him as a contributing editor to the AAI Journal. Now, he's a retired founder of Merriman Wealth Management, and he's now president of the Merriman Financial Educational Foundation. He has really dedicated his efforts to educating investors, both young and old. And in fact, I did a Google search uh, on Paul, and the word that popped up was educator. That was uh, right away the first word that popped up. And uh, so beyond working uh, and doing articles for the association, he writes a regular column on marketwatch.com on the retirement page, and he produces a weekly podcast called Sound Investing. So if you do a search in your favorite podcast aggregator, you'll find it quite easily. I think the webinars, I think the, uh, the podcast only come out every Wednesday, and the interesting interview actually of Paul that came out this today, and they talked about uh, the impact of community, and I learned now where Paul lives, and I, I vacationed in Bainbridge, or actually I vacationed in Seattle a couple years ago, and we did visit Bainbridge Island and enjoyed our, our day there very much. Um, he's author of several books, and soon to be released, we're taking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement investments. And if you visit his website, paulmerriman.com, you'll find a rich collection of resources. I noticed you can even download a number of books written by Paul at no cost. And one title that caught my eye was Get Smart or Get Screwed. Right. Uh, with that, uh, Paul, uh, I'd like to welcome you tonight. Thank you, John. It is, it is great to be here. I am a huge fan of AAI. I, I've, I've been doing this for about 35 plus years. And so uh, AAI has truly been an important part of my life. And I like the fact that folks are looking for good information and uh, and they don't let you off easy. You have to answer a lot of questions. So uh, I hope tonight to change some lives. Uh, I understand we've got a good turnout and uh, if I can actually make an impact on 5% of the folks that are here, uh, maybe a tweak here or there in your portfolio, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be happy. And then maybe for a few, it'll be more than a little tweak. But we are dedicated at the foundation, uh, and, and Chris and Daryl uh, are both involved in our foundation uh, as well, and you'll have a chance to meet them. But we are about uh, information and tools. It's information and tools in your best interest, absolutely serving no one but you. So uh, I hope it helps. Now, there are six main areas that we focus our work. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking about two of them, and the first two are the choice of equity asset classes that we put in our portfolio. We all know that the gas is going gonna, is gonna to come, the, the energy, the growth is going to come out of the equity, and we got the bonds there for the breaks. And so the question becomes tonight, what equity asset classes do we need in our portfolio? And of course, that leads to the question as to how much of each of those equity asset classes should we invest in. Now, the other four areas that we do a lot of work with, and uh, I've even added in the PDF uh, some, some samples of studies that we've done uh, having to do with things like uh, distributions in retirement or accumulating money towards retirement but we really are focused both for the first time investor on equities, but when it comes to the, the near retiree or retiree, we're working about equities and fixed income. And at the end of the day, I think what does differentiate our work from a lot of other people is that we're willing to name names. We are not willing to tell you how much you should have in equities and how much you should have in fixed income but we are willing to tell you at Vanguard, at T. Rowe Price, at Schwab, at Fidelity, what mutual funds or ETFs you could have in your portfolio. And of course, you all know that uh, uh, this is only for educational purposes. Uh, the recommendations are not specific to any individual 
If you're a do-it-yourselfer and been with AAII for a long time, you probably don't need to talk to a financial advisor. But if you haven't, I strongly suggest that you do check with your financial advisor. And these are the three free books. The first thing we did right out of the gate when I retired, I sold my firm back in 2012, uh, took part of the proceeds, started a financial education foundation. And the first project was to create these three uh, books, the one for first time investors, one for, uh, as John noted, the get smarter, get screwed, how to select the best and get the most from your financial advisor. That was for people who were in the process of hiring an advisor. And I'm a believer that this business is all about coming to simple decisions, forks in the roads, in the road and making the right decision. And so we wrote a very simple 101 investment decisions guaranteed to change your financial future. All of this was good stuff, except for one thing. I didn't get it. I didn't understand how to transition from being a purely an, an investment advisor to being an educator. Because what I was trying to do, I was trying to show investors, how do you build a portfolio like Paul Merriman has, or, or like Paul Merriman manages for others, or the folks that work uh, and still work at my old firm. And, and so what I did was, the, the portfolio, for example, at Fidelity, suggested this is for a beginner. Put a little bit in an S&P 500, a little bit in a value large and small and REITs and, and emerging markets and all of these different asset classes. And I went merrily along thinking I was helping people put their life together and making a smart investment, which smart to the extent that that's what I did with my money. Well, finally, somebody helped straighten me out. Uh, Daryl had been with uh, as a volunteer, for, and by the way, these guys, hundreds of hours, of volunteer hours every year to do what they're doing to help others. I, I just uh, couldn't be prouder of what these guys have done. But uh, Daryl joined us in 2014, and then in 2016, Chris came aboard, and it wasn't very long before Chris was saying, hey, this is way too complex. You need to simplify. And being a little thick-skinned, uh, I, I, I didn't jump immediately, although I thought it sounded like a good idea. But then I visited John Bogle in his office in June of 2017. And uh, he gave me 60 minutes. That 60 minutes turned into 90 minutes. And uh, he did uh, some uh, finger wagging at me. He was a big fan, by the way, of uh, Dr. Fama and Dr. French and all of the work that goes on at at the DFA, in fact, he said they were they were certainly great uh, competitors of uh, Vanguard. But his point was, as good as all that may be, that do-it-yourself investors, and of course, that's the, the what Vanguard appeals to. They simply won't do this kind of complex uh, strategy portfolio building uh, and and stay the course. It, it, it doesn't mean that they won't set it up but then you got to rebalance all these different asset classes and and uh the, all of the the things that 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 investors don't like to deal with uh in fact many of those do-it-yourself investors really should have an advisor and uh, but he was right i talked to a lot of people after i talked to him and he was right they were being kind to me they were they were humoring me but they weren't doing what I was recommending. And so uh, we went back to the drawing board and with the help of Chris and Daryl, we started to build portfolios of smaller numbers of holdings. But it's not just the confusion of, of how you build a portfolio or how you manage a portfolio that keeps investors from getting the best return that they should. And that's something we focus a lot on. How do you get the most that you should have coming to you if you position your portfolio in the right way? Now, we never know the right way beforehand, but you know, the, do we do the best we can? And those things that tend to keep us from getting what we should is one, not enough time. I'm 77 in a couple of weeks, and uh, I don't know how long I have. 
And I'm going to be talking about some strategies tonight that look great for the next 40 years. Well, I'm not sure I have enough time to see the big advantage of some of this fine work. And then a lot of people just simply don't have the patience. Uh, people, and you had Larry Swedro on here several weeks ago. Uh, I, I just, he's, he's one of my heroes. And he was talking about how little patience that, uh, that investors have. Uh, that even three years is asking way too much of most investors for them to wait for a strategy to do what it's supposed to do. So there's not enough patience. And for many of us, not enough good luck. That's one of the, the laughs that, uh, that John Bogle and I had about his good luck and my good luck. His good luck was he started an index fund at, at the beginning of a period when for 25 years, the market compounded at 17 plus percent. I mean, that's luck. On the other hand, had he started that mutual fund in 2000, would he have been the famous man that he ended up being? Because it's compounded at about 6% since then. Well, who knows? But good luck is very important and not everybody gets it. And also, and this one's a tough one, most people do not have a very good sense of the history of investing. They know how to critique the recent past. We hear a lot about value investing is dead. It hasn't performed well for years. Well, wait until you see how patient you have to be to get the advantage of value investing, at least based on the past. So I think people need a better sense of history, and that's a lot of what our organization is about because we cannot change people's luck. We are not there to control their level of impatience, but we can help create realistic expectations. I think we can help find the evidence that they can trust, and that's because we're trying to look at evidence over a very long period of time, knowing full well all that evidence doesn't lead to profitability, that the market is going to do what it doggone well pleases, and that's what we have to live with. But we do the best we can with what we have. So our work is about creating realistic expectations, and a lot of that is having to do with the downside. I think what gets in the way of success for a lot of investors, not just this, this sense of impatience, but they invest in, in a, in a, with a feeling of optimism. And so that optimism drives them to write some really big checks to get into to positions where they think they're going to make a lot of money. And what happens then is they face the normal loss of losing periods that investing uh, gives us. In fact, I used to do six-hour workshops free to the public and when I was building my, uh, my practice. And one of the points I always made was if you will follow my advice, I absolutely guarantee you will lose money. And that is something that we need to teach people. It's part of the process. I want to know how much you're willing to lose and how long you're willing to lose it for in order to look at the past and figure out, okay, with those, whatever your, your limits are, let's build a portfolio with those limits. So prepare for the worst periods. And then we also have to prepare for this disappointment that we have when we invest in something and at the end of the year, it didn't do what we thought it was going to do. I, when I was an advisor, I should have kept a diary of the things that made me smile when I had conversations with clients. I would have a client who was 50% in bonds and 50% in stocks. The market would have a good year and they would call me and they would say, Paul, I, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. Why aren't we doing as well as the market? Well, it's because you're not the market. You're half in bonds. But people have these, these intuitive the tracking air benchmarks that we have to deal with. And so we need to make sure that investors understand how often and 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 how few times they do in fact track what their benchmark is. And it isn't just about a benchmark for 
a year with most real long-term strategies, you need to have a, a, a benchmark that is based on decades returns. From time to time, somebody will ask me, how have I done with, with my own investments? And my answer, and, and I, I don't think anybody will ever do it, but what I suggest is, after I die, call my wife and ask how I did. Because the fact is, it doesn't matter how well I've done up to this point. Uh, it's it's how I handle the rest of the way. So we really don't know how good we are for a very long period of time. As you know, the real the the real return we have that means something that isn't blue sky is the the income we take out of our investments when we're retired. That's real. And then the money that we leave charity and children, that's real. The rest of it is basically blue sky. And so we have to prepare people for the possibility of having things be under their expectation for a very long period of time, which is one of the reasons I think that people are probably more likely to, to succeed if they are very broadly, massively diversified, so they don't focus in on any one thing too much. Dr. Fama was once supposedly uh, asked, uh, uh, what's wrong with your research? Your research says that small cap is supposed to beat large cap. And for 30 years, uh, large cap has outperformed small cap. How do you defend that? And the response was, you're not very patient, are you? So this is something that we have got to really get through to people that the expectations that we have have nothing to do with what the market cares to do. Now, I love this. Daryl Balls put this together. I, many of you, I'm sure, have seen the Callan tables. And the Callan tables will, will show you yearly results for maybe 20 different asset classes. Wonderful to, to see the ups and the downs on a yearly basis, but you know, that's, that's noise. And even a decade, and here what we have is we do have nine decades here of performance with four of the biggest, uh, most important U.S asset classes, equity asset classes, small value, small blend, large value, large blend, the S&P 500, and just so you see how these things look with bonds, long-term government bonds, and a one-month T-bill. Okay, there's a perfect lesson here. We know exactly what the academics say that should happen if you own these asset classes. Small cap value should outperform small cap blend. It's more risky, and it did, 13.7 versus 12.2. And the small blend should outperform large value. It did, 12.2 to 11.1. And large value should outperform the S&P 500, and it did 9.8. And stocks outperform bonds. Perfect. Everything worked over 90 years. But when we start looking, and by the way, all that is, is about taking more risk to get more return. But when we look back and we look at the decades that these asset classes lived through, you can see in the very first one you were tested because the, S, the small cap value is down here at the bottom rather than up here at the top. But that was a very difficult time. The S&P 500 lost during the 30s one-tenth of 1%, 1 including the reinvestment of, of, of dividends. This does not address inflation. But then for the next four decades, things looked fairly good. U.S. small at top, and then the U.S. small blend is sitting down below there. And the S&P down here towards the bottom. And we keep doing that until 2000 through 2000, uh, 19, I'm sorry, 1990 through 1999, the S&P is number one. Not by a whole lot, but it's still number one. And then it collapses the next decade to be the last one on the list. And then it recovers and becomes first again. So. 
what can we learn from all of these gyrations? Well, for one thing, it appears that over a very long period of time, the market comes to its senses. But on the short-term basis, even 10 years being a short-term period, uh, it can get out of whack from expectations. But it also teaches us another lesson that I think is one of the most important on this page. It says, hey, why don't you take a little of the small value and a little of the cap, small cap blend and the large value and the S&P 500, and why don't you create a portfolio that not only diversifies amongst thousands of companies, but also diversifies among different asset classes. Now, th there's a debate as to whether small cap value is an asset class, is a sector, uh, what it is. You know something? It doesn't really matter to me so much as, as it matters that those small, risky companies sometimes for a very long period are kind of dormant and then they explode and they tend to explode together as a group for whatever reason. You see, if you're a buy and holder, which is what I'm talking about here tonight, then your, your life as an investor is not about reason. It is not about reason. It is not about trying to figure out, well, who's going who's gonna to get the presidency or or who's going to get on the Supreme Court, or or what are they going to do with interest rates? You know, you're a buy and holder. Buy and holder, theoretically, isn't supposed to care about that as it applies to the portfolio. So I start then asking questions, not about the intelligence of spreading amongst all of these different asset classes, but what happens if you do put together the more risky with the more conservative, and then let them go for longer periods of time. And as you can see, when you've got a portfolio that's built of four different asset classes, you never get to be number one, ever. So the more diversification that you have in your portfolio, the further away from number one you will ever be. A myth. I've got a list of about 200 investment myths. It's gonna be part of a book I'm working on, a thousand things you should know about investing. It's my final work. But here's something I learned, many of you learned, it's almost impossible to beat the S&P 500, remember that? Very few people, even the smartest of, of, of managers, uh, managing billion dollar portfolios find it very difficult to beat the S&P 500. Well, it turns out it's really not very difficult at all. It, it turns out that in fact, if you look at this particular period, this 90 years, that the four fund combo outperformed the S&P 500. Of course, the four fund combo includes the S&P 500. And that it looks to me like not only does it not make more money, but I'm looking at all this bad stuff down here at the bottom. Decades when the S&P 500 didn't do very well. Yes, they got to be on top a couple times, but if we go out 20 years, and I know this is not every 20 year period, but when we go out 20 years, 40 to 59, 60 to 79, look at that four fund combo sitting right in there, you know, it's it's not expected to beat small cap value or small cap blend because it's sitting on this large cap value in S&P 500. But I just want you to notice that if we're trying to get young people to invest for the long term, I don't care whether it's the S&P 500 or the total market index, which since 1928 have virtually the very same return, that we may not be giving them the best advice and a simple four fund strategy might be better. The jewel of simplicity. Um, I am not uh, the, uh, the statistician. I am not the quant in our organization. I am fortunately am stuck being the teacher, but um, 
I've got the good fortune of having a couple of really good quants and and I did not know what the telltale chart was, but now I know. And I know that John Bogle, I don't know that he actually developed the tell, <clears throat> telltale chart, but he talks about it in a paper of his a speech he made, I uh, think back around 2001. And it's a way of showing uh, reversion to the mean and 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 uh, the returns of different asset classes. And what you do is you you divide the cumulative returns to date of one series into another. So in this particular case, we're going to look at a telltale chart that the denominator is the S&P 500 and the numerator is the four fund combo. And here's the secret that I even understand. When uh, the slope of the returns are going upward, that means that the numerator or the US four fund strategy is outperforming. And when that slope is downward, it means that the denominator or the S&P 500 is outperforming. And I will tell you, when I saw that chart, it changed my ability to, to I think, to, uh, to share the idea of the long term and the and the commitment to a strategy better than I ever have before. So here is in Figure Four, and Daryl put this together. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, the telltale chart for 90 years, starting here. Remember when the returns or the direction is here. The idea, the strategy of the four funds is working, it's outperforming the S&P 500. But when it's doing this, it's disappointment because you may have taken more risk in order to get that and you're not getting it. And now we're talking about how much patience you'll have to get it. But you can see, and this is not, by the way, here about the return, but I can tell you here, the whole stretch of this all the way to the end of the 90 years is about the return because that is 5.7 times the starting point. So let me tell you what the starting point was with the S&P 500 and the ending point starting with $100, ending here at the end of 2019 with about $450,000. And the for fun strategy, having pushed more upward motion than downward motion, ended up with 5.7 times more or about two and a half million dollars. Now, I know, I know that there aren't many people here tonight who are gonna live for 90 years, but guess what? Many of you have grandchildren who are going to live for 90 years. And so while this strategy may not be appropriate for you, I'm thinking you might know somebody in your life that could use it. But I wanted to show this particular graph chart because I wanna show the period of a decade. And the reason I wanted to focus on the decades, every red ball here point is another decade. I want you to notice that none of those decades look alike. Nothing ever repeats. That it, 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 it isn't something that a market timer could say, oh, I know what you should do when this does that and this, and then you get into the US four fund and then you get out. No, it, I don't think there's a pattern here that market timers are gonna use. Now, here is what I do know that this is maybe the most sobering uh, figure of all, because here it shows what would happen to investors who got in at, let's call it the peak. Now, who might get in at the peak? You know anybody who likes to get in at the peak? Well, I know AAII members do not get in at the peak, but let's face it, a lot of investors 
were very attracted to technology in the late 90s after the big gain had been made. And so they get in and then all of a sudden there's more negative negative stuff going on. The S&P is doing better. It isn't back to even for 20 years. So can you imagine how many articles will be written? The four fun strategy is dead. Well, then it came back and it grabbed a little more of the pie, but then it came back down and it was out of favor in essence for eight years before it broke even again. And then it took a nice run and then it was flat for 17 years. And right now it's flat for 14 years. Now we could do this same thing with small cap value. And we, by the way, we have, I just only had so much time tonight, but the bottom line lesson here is that when you use strategies that have the potential to add a lot of value, because generally they have more risk, you're gonna need to be realistic about the waiting period. So I want my college students to know this. Uh, I want them to be committed to hanging up the phone when a stockbroker calls, and I want them to be committed to index funds for the rest of their life. I want them to be committed to indexing for the rest of their life. And I want them to be committed to a series of asset classes that are likely to perform well over the long term. Here's my favorite. This tells it all. It's a little busy, but I wanna add one more thing here. Here we have little green arrow showing from the point that it was a back to break even this run of five years, this run of three years, this run of seven years, this run of five years. That's what made the difference. Now, yes, so did the recovery. Of course it did, but it was just recovering to make up lost time to break even again. 70 and a half months. I, uh, over that period, I'm sorry, uh, out of the 90 years, 70 and a half years, you were underwater. A very small percentage of the time were you doing what you thought you were supposed to be doing in the first place. And that is why I think if we don't encourage and educate and 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 remind young investors or investors who don't understand this process very well, that it's long-term. This is a true story. I once had a lady, became a client, spent a couple of hours with her explaining the process. She had been to the six-hour workshop and she committed to having risk tolerance. Yes, she could take it. And she opened the account, and I believe she was willing to lose 20% or some number that was fairly conservative, 40% you know, equity kind of a portfolio. And at the end of the first month, she was down. And she closed her account. And so I called her, you know, we're always worried that we said something that was gonna lead to an attorney calling us and saying, you promised because this was weird. And I called her and I said, do you remember when we talked about the losses that you agreed were reasonable for you? And she said, yes. I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, I thought I would go up before I went down. And so she experienced the worst thing that can happen to a lot of investors, not loss in the market, loss of principle. So if we're gonna help people be successful investors, we gotta be honest with them. And I think this is a truth that needs to be known. Uh, Chris Pedersen just built this bar 
graph for us here in the last couple of days. I like it. Part of the reason is because a couple of days ago, I was talking to a fellow who was 68 years old, has enough money from his pension and social security, he and his wife, to meet all their cost of living. They've got about 800,000 in an IRA. And he was wanting to know whether using the four fund strategy made any sense for him because he's 68 years old. Well, it's the same question I asked myself. Does it make any sense for me to have a portfolio? I have more than four funds, but I still have half in stocks, uh, half in, in big, half in small, half in value, about half in growth, a little less than half in growth, a little more than half in value. But should I be that aggressive? What's why? Why would I do that? Well, in his case, look. If you look at all the five-year periods from 1970 to 2019, and there are starting every month with a new five-year period, and then when you get to 2019, looping around to 1970 to start over, you create about 600 periods. The average number of periods that beat the S&P 500 over five years were 58%. And then when you go to 10 years, it's 61%. And then 15 years, it's 75%. Well, we're talking about more than the rest of my life, more than likely. I have not been kind to my body. If I get another 10 here. I mean, this is what I'm probably dealing with. But you go out 20 years, and by the time you go out to 100, and, and Chris said, I, you know, I hate to put that number there because people will believe that actually it's guaranteed. No, it's not guaranteed. But I'm willing to take the risk that I will underperform the S&P 500. And I'm taking it myself because my investments are for beyond me. And uh, hopefully, uh, my kids will continue to invest money the way I have been. And, and in fact, we all actually have our money being invested by our old firm. They do what we believe in. But the bottom line is, each one of us needs to ask that question, particularly if we're 80, 85, 90 years old. Is it worth it? Now, by the way, how much more are you likely to get? Over five years, who knows? Let me give you five years you might think about and say, I don't think that's the five years that I want. I wrote this down because I knew I wouldn't remember it, but 1995 to 1999, the S&P 500 compounded at 28.5%. The four fund strategy at 20.9% you would have underperformed by a lot. By the way, it turns out on average, the difference between the four fund strategy and the S&P 500 is about 7% a year. They don't go up and down at the same rate. And sometimes it's fairly radical. But 2002 through 2004, that was my luck, where, where John Bogle had his 1976 to 1999 luck. I had the good luck of having my clients broadly diversified, big, small, value growth, U.S. international, all of those things, REITs and emerging markets. But the 2000 through 2004 period, the S&P 500 lost. 2.3% a year versus the four funds gained 9.4. So uh, I can't tell you what that difference will be. There are too many potential outcomes, but what we know for the long term, it's about a 2% difference in return. So now I'm going to start talking about some. Um, some portfolios, some simple, easy portfolios. I'm gonna compare them. I'm not gonna compare very many. I'm only gonna compare 11. I hope you like the way I compare them and that you'll do some thinking yourself about how 
you might compare different portfolios. But I can tell you, if you want to compare more, go to the, actually just go do uh, uh, an internet search for the title, 150 Portfolios Better Than Yours. It was produced by Jim Dahl at the White Coat Investor, or if you want more to choose from, 235 Portfolios Better Than Yours out of Portfolio Einstein. What I'm not going to talk about tonight, I'm not going to talk about two funds for life because that is what I think is one of the best systems in the industry. And that is the work of Chris, Chris uh, Pedersen. And Chris is going to be right here, AAII, on October 21. In fact, they're ready to take reservations right now. The title, Simple and Effective Balanced Portfolios for Lifetime Investing Success. I think it is absolutely wonderful work, and it's something that almost every investor can do. All right, let me dig in. Let me talk about very quickly the uh, 11 portfolios. First one, recommended by Warren Buffett. Put all your money in the S&P 500. The second one recommended by J.L. Collins. J.L. Collins is one of the heroes of the FIRE movement, the financial independence, re retire early. And he has helped young people by recommending that they put the money in the total U.S. market. And then I added one, nobody said ever said to buy this one, but I just want you to know it's out there and we'll see how it did. It's a cap weighted total world market, total world. So it changes as the world changes. Right now, the internationals are worth less than the U.S., and sometimes the internationals are worth more than the U.S. You're going to see how it did over the last 30 years. And what I've done is I've kicked out any fixed income. So when I looked at the Bogleheads three-fund portfolio, I took out the bonds because the only way for me to compare all these different portfolios is to get rid of the bonds. Then you can decide how much you should have in bonds. But they are 70% total market U.S. and 30% total market international. And then a little bit of fake news here. I made up as Fama, Dr. Fama and Dr. French, the people who created these two portfolios. 30% in small cap value and the rest in the total U.S. market, 30% in small cap value and the rest in the total world market. And the reason I gave them credit is because they're the ones that did the, 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 the academic work on factors that alerted people to the small and value premiums. And then we've got one that we've shown for years, uh, all U.S. value. And then one, this is Rick Ferry. Rick Ferry, I think, does some great work. He's got a series of recommendations called the Core Four. And he's got three equity funds. So three. this is a three-fund strategy as I see it. 60% in the total market index, 10% in REITs, 10, 30% in the international total market. And then the next is the 25% each in the four funds US. And then a really clever a strategy by a, a Trev, called the Trev H, 25% in the same four big, small value blends, except he does half of it US and half of it international. And then an all value, all world, half in US, half and international. So those are the team, okay? Now we're gonna see how the teams did. In each case, we're showing what 10,000 grew to over 30 years. And let me stop right there. 30 years, you would think is a long time and you think it's meaningful. But I want you to know right now, it understates the likelihood of international returns because the prior 20 years to this 30 years, internationals in some cases doubled the returns of US. In some cases, it was only 50% more than the US. So I am not, I, I, I wanna be careful that I don't misrepresent. These returns 
are unique to this period. Now, what, what, what we know is, uh, and, and Daryl did all this work, this is great. He shows you how much it made for the whole period, how much it made for each decade, and, and then what it turned into if you invested $10,000. And, and, and by the way, he did in, include expenses in this, even though they were indexes that we tracked. You would have made more if you were in the total market because it made two-tenths of 1% more. You would have made less if you were in the total world because internationals were the pits, and instead of making 10%, you would have made about seven. The three-fund strategy from uh, Bogleheads, the, the two equity portion grew to be worth 125, 126. The total US with 30% small cap value, 258. The total world with 30% small cap value, 150. The all value US, just the two funds, 50% each, 325. Now, before I leave this page, I want you to notice Daryl also gave us information on the good years and the bad. And there's another thing you should know about that is biased about this 30 years. There were only 20%, six years, the S&P lost money. That is 20% of the years. That is way lower than we would expect in a 30-year period. We would expect 25 to 30% of the years to be losing years. So you always got to be careful uh, to understand the history behind any performance. And here's the worst year, 2008, a loss of 37. The total market, a loss of 36.6. You'll notice they're all about the same. They're around 38, 39, 40. So it didn't matter in terms of the worst loss that you sustained. Then we have Rick Ferry's, his core, just the three funds, the three equity funds grew to 128. Now Rick's got a portion of that, a uh, sizable portion in international. So it would have done better if you could include the previous 20 years. But you can see it did do better in that period, 2000 through 2009, than the S&P 500. But it's loss, it's worst loss. And he had seven of them. It's worst loss was around the same as the S&P 500. And then we get to the four fund, the, the, the one I've been talking about all night here. Uh, it grew to 283,000, 11.8% compound rate of return, 6.1% in the 2000 through 2009 compound rate of return. It had seven losing years. The worst year, 2008, down 38.2, virtually the same as the S&P 500. Now, the Trev 4, remember, he's got half of that money in international, but he still did pretty doggone well for having half that money in internationals, 162,000. Shows the help that value gave that portfolio, small value, large value. And then an all value, half US, half international, 235 with a portfolio that, that, that we recommend. So there are a lot of people who will say over a lot of years, uh, all the strategies come out about the same. No, they do not come out about the same. Now, maybe if it went out 50 years, they would come out about the same. And I will tell you, we're working on that too. And we will report that. I hope every one of you becomes subscribers to our newsletter, The Price is Right, or read our articles at AAII, because we'll do our best to help there as well. Ah, numbers, what I love. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting what numbers do to some people. They put them to sleep. Uh, I'm not going to spend here very much time because it will put some to sleep, but I know the people who really like numbers will be back or they'll look at the PDF because not only do I have numbers here going back uh, 30 years, but you'll see a lot of numbers in that PDF go back 50 years. 
Now we're going to look what the ride was like year by year for each one of these. I'm not going through every year, but I'm going to point out here that in 1990, the first year that of the study, down 3.1, this magic portfolio from Merriman, four funds down 15.7. How are you feeling so far? And really, you, you don't see massive advantages until you get up here into the period of 2000 through 2002. Because I already told you we underperformed in that 95 through 99 period. Look at those years the S&P 500 had. 37.6, up 23, up 33, up 28, up 21. Did you know that people at the end of that run when they were surveyed predicted that for the next decade, the return for the S&P 500 would be 20 to 30% a year? Is there any recency bias showing itself there? Well, I think there are some of you who really take this stuff to heart and are really thinking about, well, what might you do? By the way, let me just suggest for some of you, you might have a, you might have a, an, an IRA Roth IRA, you got a regular IRA, you got a 401k, your spouse has some of the same. You could set up, you could set up one in a four fund strategy and another account in a, in a three fund strategy. You could diversify. It's not difficult. None of these are hard to rebalance. And thanks again, Daryl. And my God, you make my, my life easy. Look at this. What a story this tells. What a story this tells about that, those same returns, but highlighting each year the, the, the very best and the very worst. And then you sit back and you kind of look. What are the conclusions intuitively? What do you see here? Well, for one thing, I see the S&P 500 is either a lot of the time at the very top or at the very bottom. That it maybe isn't as uh, kind of dependable as what I always believed that it was. Even down here at the bottom, they have the best decade in 1990 to 98, the best in 1910 to 19, uh, 2000, 2019, and then the worst, 2009 through 2000. What do I see? I see some people are, are not either honored or, or, or cussed ever because they're never the best and they're never the worst. You know, for a lot of people who have found great comfort in balanced funds, they like the bonds and the stocks, makes them feel good. They're never the best, they're never the worst. And yet most of those balanced funds, the equity portion is sitting in something, oftentimes like the S&P 500, or oftentimes something very value oriented, which is not bad, I'm just saying that notice how up and down the value was. Although the value had more green than it did yellow. There's some good lessons here. I do see this. I notice that Fama and French, they may not have recommended these portfolios, but they did just fine and they didn't make it to the top or the bottom. Well, we are here to help with podcasts. We've got over 500 of them available to you, over 300 articles, mutual fund recommended portfolios and ETFs. Uh, I, I, I have to tell you that Chris Pedersen has done all the work on the ETF portfolios. I, I know he's written, he's written, by the way, uh, he's written an article on choosing ETFs at AAII. He has a new article coming out uh, in the first week of uh, October uh, on the two fund strategy, I believe. Uh, 
and then and lots of other ways uh, to try to help investors. Here's that book that uh, John mentioned. Uh, I'd like to say it's worth taking money, millions, but we're talking millions. And this is 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. Now, we don't know if we can get a 20-year-old to even think about retirement, but this book was written for them or 30-year-olds. And we didn't want to put on the cover what we believe because we don't think people would have believed it. But each of these very simple 12 decisions, 12 steps, 12 ways can be converted into an extra million dollars plus over their lifetime. And I'm not talking about people who are investing $50,000 a month. I'm talking about families that are, are investing a total of 5,000 a month. And it's built to be as simple. Rich Buck and I, and Rich has been working with me for over 30 years. He actually is the guy who knows how to write. I'm the guy that knows how to come up with the ideas and to edit. And you wouldn't buy this book if I wrote it, but Rich does know how to write. In a couple of weeks, um, we are. I'm going to be on uh, an evening conversation with Rick Ferry and Larry Swedrow, uh, sponsored by Choose FI. Uh, Choose FI and AAII have so much in common because they really are dedicated to lots of education. Choose FI is trying to help the 20 and 30 year old re re retire by the time uh, they're 40 or 50. I'm sure a lot of their parents would prefer they'd never found Jews FI because one of the things a lot of those kids decided to do was to move home and live with their parents to save money. Interesting outcome of life. Anyhow, I hope that you'll have a chance to come join us. Uh, Rick and Larry are two of the brightest people I know in the industry. And uh, I probably won't have a whole lot to say, but I am honored to be amongst their, their company. And by the way, if you do sign up for our newsletter, you will be contacted for uh, an offer. It won't last forever, but for an offer to get a copy of our new book. It will be a PDF copy. And what I want you to do when you get that is I want you, please, to send it to the young people in your family. And uh, and then I'd love for you all to go write uh, a review at uh, Amazon. Well, that is the end of, of 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 my of my presentation. And John, I'm I'm up. It's up to you. You're the boss now. I'm ready. And well, thank you. Uh, do you want to bring up your uh, other panelists, uh, Ryan? Do you want to put put them on the camera, please? I should do quick some introdu quick introductions, please, for the audience. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we have uh, on our panel, um, as uh, Paul was uh, alluding to, uh, Chris Pedersen, uh, who helped him uh, put together this presentation. I uh, say hi, Chris. <laughs> hi. And and uh, uh, Daryl Balls, who uh, uh, also uh, put together some of the tables and uh, de data that you saw in the tables. So uh, w welcome to the panel. And uh, I guess this is uh, the time now for the uh, Q and A portion of tonight's program. Yeah, and uh, our, Paul and his guests have agreed graciously to stay on for the next half hour. And they're also going to take note of all the questions we've submitted, you've submitted, and they'll answer them afterwards as well if you don't get to them tonight. And uh, so great presentation, Paul. Uh, brought up a lot of great questions from our members. And uh, let's start off here with uh, just, uh, let's see here. Um, how do I, uh, let's see here. In your book, 2012 book, Financial Fitness Forever, you recommend REITs to be a portion of your portfolio as they rescue risk and increase return. And uh, amongst your allocations there, it, it was about 12%. You're wondering, he's, this person's wondering, if how do the REITs play in today's uh, investment environment and the allocation? 
Well, uh, John, in that in that book, there uh, was an assumption that there was a uh, combination of fixed income and equity in those portfolios. But when we look just at equity, just at equity, uh, it represents 10 percent uh, of the of the portfolio. And what we do in that book is we go, we start with the S&P 500 and what was the return? And then we add 10 percent large cap value. What did that do to the portfolio? What did it do to the risk? What did it do to the return? And we keep adding 10% at a time. And the REITs are number five. They come in and they add one-tenth of 1% 1 pound rate of return over the 50-year uh, period or whatever period that we, that we ran that particular study. The addition of REITs reduces the risk in fact, it has more impact in essence on the risk than it does on the return. But historically, it has added one tenth of 1%. So it's not a make or break deal. And of course, REITs are not supposed to be in a taxable account. They're supposed to be in a tax deferred or tax free account. But I have no reason not to have that 10% position. It hasn't been a good year for REITs, but it hasn't been a good year for a lot of things. That's for sure. Um, when the opportunity comes up, I've got a, a fan here, um, a question for Paul, uh, and he's listened to your podcast. He's been actually doing two podcasts a day since last December, and uh, he's been one of those people that's uh, in the past invested with emotion, and uh, he gets it, he understands it, and it was a bad choice on his end. Uh, moving forward, if a person has, you know, let's say, you know, money to invest now, and 401k, uh, regardless, and they're in the 40, you know, regardless of what they have invested in the past, uh, the ship has sailed in the past, you know, what's 10 years to retirement, what's the best strategy to go going forward? Well, uh, the best strategy is going to have a lot to do with his risk tolerance, his need for return, what kind of income he needs to get out of that. Uh, you, you really have to address it as a financial planner first and foremost. Also, how what level of complexity, whether he wants to work with one equity fund or uh, a, a lot of people. In, in fact, Chris, I mean, I, I realize when you're 10 years away from retirement, the two funds for life may not uh, be uh, going to make a great difference, but it could be so simple as as two funds for life. So. Uh, what would you what would you say to that? I, I think two funds for life might work, but I would also uh, say exactly where you what you started with, and that's that uh, there's just too many things about his circumstance we don't know. So spending a little time with a planner um, would probably not be a bad thing. If if he was your client, you would have spent a half hour with him at least, maybe an hour or two, right, before you could come up with a plan. And so, yeah, I, I, I think it's just, it's uh, too many things we don't know to answer the question. But here's what I could say, though, that, that might help. In the PDF, we have two examples of a fine-tuning table. A fine-tuning table shows the returns from 1970 through 2019. It shows the S&P 500 as the equity position, and it, in another table, it shows the four fund strategy as the equity. And then what it does, it has columns of adding fixed income, 10% fixed income, 20% fixed income, 30, all the way up to 100% fixed income. And what that table shows is the risk of those different combinations of equities and fixed income. Because what he's gonna have to deal with, I don't care whether he's, on which side of retirement he is. I mean, I'm set almost 77 and I'm half in stocks and half in bonds. Well, that's not what Vanguard says to do. I should be 30% in equity and 70% and, and in bonds. But my situation warrants my choice of how much in stocks and bonds. But those tables are to help do it yourself. Investors kind of come to grips with that risk return relationship they've got to try to create. Very good. I, I've got a, 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 another member here, uh, Greg, and he's, he's wondering, okay, let's say I, I how, what's the best way to determine what portion, let's say I invest in a four, four fund portfolio, what portion or which funds would you recommend to be 
in the taxable side versus the non-taxable. Any thoughts along that way? You know, I think we actually, um, and help me on this, uh, whether we actually made a difference on those uh, differentiated between, uh, for example, the Vanguard taxable and the, and the, and the uh, tax deferred. You, you could see that, in essence, at our website. We okay. have all of these portfolios at Vanguard Fidelity. We have them for taxable and tax deferred uh, at Vanguard. So you could see what we recommended, and then you'd have, for example, uh, you have, uh, Chris, you have uh, ETFs that uh, are both for taxable and tax deferred. So your list would be a possible source of what to do as well. Yeah, we, we differentiate the fund recommendations for taxable and tax deferred, but John, was the question how much to have in taxable and how much to have in I think the question, is there any advantage deferred? to say put uh, large caps in a tax uh, deferred account versus small caps? Is there any thoughts along? This should you okay, should so you not portfolio, portfolio location versus allocation. I think, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, then putting REITs, you know, they're income producing, they're going to produce taxable income, putting them in the tax deferred accounts is a good strategy. Uh, fixed income produces, you know, more taxable um, income that tends to be better placed in the tax deferred accounts. Um, you're, you're, so you can balance that out with shifting some of your equities um, that are going to be high growth, low dividend into your taxable account because they're not going to generate as much tax liability on an annual basis. They'll let you defer the tax because until you sell it, you don't, you don't realize it, right? So, yeah. Uh, I, just a, a person here who, uh, you know, thanks, Paul, thanks for all you do for young investors and he, all three of his children, He he's, they're ages 15 to 21, and uh, they've started their own IRAs. Hey, hey and, good. Uh, his two oldest children have uh, uh, taken, you know, the belief and have they listened to your podcasts, and he's passing them on. The two oldest ones are, are, are you know, are happy to go with ETFs, but there's one that's looking at actively traded funds. <laughs> Any advice you can give? I want to talk to that kid. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Isn't that interesting though? Isn't that interesting how you can lay out all the evidence uh, and the and the and the brokerage industry? And I'm not I'm not being mean about this. They're good people, but they have to defend their particular business, and they are able to convince people that they can pick the people who are going to outperform the market ahead of time. We all know better, but it sticks in people's minds because it makes sense that smart people should be able to figure this out, even if I can't. I agree. It's always a challenge, you know. Uh, with, with bond yields being so low and low interest rates, uh, a person here is wondering, Joshua, whether it's better to be in dividend funds, uh, all equity, any thoughts as far as that element, versus doing equity income funds, equity income funds versus bond funds? Uh, you know, I unfortunately did not wear my hearing aid tonight. Would you? <laughs> I, the, the, the bond yields the, being so low I didn't hear. and interest rates are low, uh, yeah. any thoughts about using dividend equity funds as opposed to bond funds to get income in your portfolio? Uh, th no, no, I, I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, because those of us who, for example, lived through 73 and 74 uh, and saw dividend-based uh, funds go down 50% uh, know that those are not the same as bonds. Uh, we really do believe, and a lot, a lot of folks, Larry Swedrow would agree with this, I'm sure that Rick would agree with this, that uh, your bonds are there as a break and, and that the stock is your growth. And 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 so you, you want to have bonds that really perform well in, in in difficult times, but be more growth oriented. I'm not talking about uh, uh, the, the Nasdaq or you know high tech. I'm talking about diversified portfolio. It could be big cap. It could be the S and P 500 is fine, but that you're you're better off if you look back at 2008 or years like that. 
what bonds did well. We certainly wasn't the dividend uh, dividend companies that did well. It wasn't the high yield bonds that did well. It wasn't the high grade bonds, corporate bonds that did well. It was the government bonds, the rush to quality. And so that is the approach. And then we use or recommend, or I use personally, a total return as the basis of my income distributions from all of our investments. So some year it could be coming out of fixed income, another year it could be coming out of equities. Depends on what the portfolio has done. And okay. sometimes we do things that aren't very smart, like my wife and I. We take the money out the first week of the year. And the reason we do that is that we don't want to be thinking about the market going up and down when we have to take money out every month. And so that's that's our low emotion bar there. Well, it's sometimes it's best just to have a system and stick with it, right? I mean, it's just take yeah. the emotions out of it. Exactly. Um, any thoughts about uh, using a equally weighted index versus a market cap weighted in one's uh, portfolio construction? Either one of you guys want to take it? Uh, I'll take well, it, yeah. Or, or go ahead, Daryl, you got it. I was going to say that the... The four fund combo that Paul talked about, while it is not an index, it is an equally weighted uh, investment. It's 25% each in those four asset classes. And so you sort of create your own index at that point uh, with rebalancing between the asset classes, whatever your rebalancing philosophy is. Um, go ahead, Chris, what you were going to say. I, yeah, I was just going to say that an equally weighted fund is going to give you some of the same tilts. It's going to give you a disproportionate amount of small and uh, value compared to what the market cap weighting is going to do. And so it, it'll it help a bit. Um, we don't have as much history that we can model it with, and you will pay a little bit for it too, because there's there's trading costs to to manage that, right? So um, it's hard. It's hard to say exactly how it would have compared in the past because there's not as much history for us to leverage. Yeah. And and I think too, just to add a, a thought on that, there's a debate going on that I'm I, I'm not sure it's as open and honest uh, as 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 it can be. There's this debate about small cap, about uh, I've got the total market index. And therefore, I have as much small cap as I should have. I have 5%. And, uh, and even that might not be right because that 5% might be mostly growth oriented and growth small cap doesn't do as well as value over the long term. So you're not even adding very much. But it's such a spec uh, of, of impact on that total market index that it's not a you're not you're not saying you don't believe in small cap or small cap value you're saying yes i believe in it but i don't want more than 5% yeah. and i think it may not be going all the way as as my wife and i half in small cap and half of that small cap value and so, and half of that is international it it, it is a question of well how about 10% uh would that make a difference? And that's one of the things I know Chris will talk about uh, when he does his piece uh, later in October. 10% can make a difference. It can be what I'll call life-changing, particularly if you can do that with a with a 21-year-old or a 31-year-old, uh, because even 10% is, is better than just sitting there counting on the five percent that's even the wrong five percent on top of everything else you know and if, if if someone has a shorter time horizon let's say someone has a, a five-year time horizon uh you know what would, what would your thoughts be would they should they still go with the four fund approach or should they tailor their investments depending upon a shorter time frame personally i don't uh... I don't, of course, I want it I want it to be longer term. It would depend on how much they need the money. Uh, we do a lot of work in dist on distributions, and we have two kind of distributions. We have fixed distributions where we up the ante every year by, 
by um, uh, inflation. Then we have variable distribution for people who save more than they need. And so my goal was to save more than I needed. And if you can save twice what you need, if you can do that, and people can, if you, I had to wait and retire later, but I finally got there, then you can afford to take more risk like this. Uh, and of course, the older you get in theory, and you've heard this from a lot of people, I know, John, about, about as you get older, you can actually have more equities in your portfolio because you're not gonna live very long. And if you have enough money, I mean, you have to have enough money to do that. That's the key. But, but it's a really personal thing. I think it's important that we have a reason. I have a foundation. I have almost solely funded the foundation. We've had a number of people donate, but mostly it's been my money. And when I die, more money goes into the foundation because I want to have what we're doing for people to continue after uh, I'm gone. You have uh, a continuity at AAII to do the same thing. And, and so my money is invested for the next 100, 200 years, I hope. And so I'm not afraid, but I don't blame somebody for the fact a lot of people shouldn't even be in equities, particularly the people who are gonna bail out when the, when the going gets tough. In fact, it's amazing how many people I talk to that what they should have is a single premium annuity life policy that guarantees them a pension for the rest of their life instead of putting that money in the market and screwing it up and walking away with half of what they need. That's it's very true. I mean, discipline is important and understanding how you're going to react uh, when the market is down is, is critical because any good strategy can be destroyed. Um, yeah. And a question here as far as, you know, obviously the, the time period 1990 to 2019 didn't really uh, favor internationals. Uh, any thoughts about uh, internationals going forward or, you know, whether or not they should be in a portfolio? Are you asking for a prediction? I, you know, just, yeah, I've, got them in my, yes. I've got them in my portfolio. How stupid am I? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 by the way, don't answer that question. But the, but the but why would we not invest in internationals? There are there is always list A the good news. There is always list B the bad news. You just need to pick your list, and then you can start figuring out how you should invest. I mean, when it, when it, when somebody tells me, an eighty some year old man tells me when Clinton is elected, sell everything. And I said, John, why? He says, well, I'm not having a penny in the market with that guy as our president. I spent an hour, 45 minutes or an hour on the phone with him, talking him out of it. And this is the challenge. Why would you not want to have that greater diversification where the expected return is basically the same, except you have currency diversification. Having said that, if you feel happy and secure with home bias, it's like was it Peter Lynch said, buy companies you know and understand. Well, for me, that would leave every technology company out because I don't understand them. So yes, international should be a part of the portfolio. Very good. You know, what, you know, here's a kind of a question that's a little bit more uh, broad based here. Um, what's the most common mistakes you see young first time investors make? Go ahead, Chris. I know you've worked with a lot of young people. And probably not as many as you, but um, the, the, probably the, the mistake that comes to mind the most is performance chasing. And, and the reason is that there's this opportunity to learn the wrong lessons, right? So uh, whenever we make a choice, we can make a smart choice or a bad choice, but the outcome depends, especially over a year, as much on luck as it does the quality of the choice, right? A, a year in investing just isn't long enough. So a lot of young investors will make a choice and at the end of the year, look back on it and and, draw some kind of a conclusion that's just not valid. Um, a good example, I, I have a nephew who 
was exposed to Paul's work. He learned a lot about the value of tilting towards small in value. He put all of his money in in uh, small value mutual funds. And after a year said, why am I underperforming the S&P 500? And the answer to the question is, if you wanted an S&P 500 return, you should have invested in the S&P 500, but you wanted something different, right? And you know it doesn't all come in a year. Sometimes you have to wait a long time for it. So I, I think the biggest mistake a young investor makes is drawing conclusions on, they're drawing the wrong conclusions on too little data that depends on luck, right? He he could have invested in the S&P 500 and decided at the end of the year, wow, this is the best thing sliced, since sliced bread, I'm gonna stick with it forever. And actually, if he sticks with it forever, he'll do just fine, right? Um, you know, the most important thing is probably getting them investing young and having them have the discipline to put it on autopilot, autopilot and stick with it. Um, but I, I think just too little data, wrong conclusions. That's probably the biggest mistake a lot of young investors make. And this question has come up. So just in case people are having some confusion, you know, which four funds are you talking about? And I think you also talk about them in a September uh, journal article, if I'm not mistaken. So just to repeat them so everybody could hear them. Oh, do you remember, guys, what we put in there? Do you know what you modeled it on, Daryl? Uh, the, I'm not sure I remember the specific, what was used in the specific the article. Problem. It's the same four but, I think you guys talked about tonight. <laughs> so, well, well, well no, what, were, we, what we used in the analysis. Asset. Excuse me. Go ahead, Daryl. No, no, Paul, go ahead. You. No, the, the, those are what we talked about tonight are the asset classes. Right. So ah. if you went to Chris's list and you wanted to do this with the ETFs, you could look at the large cap blend, the large cap value, yeah. small yeah, so cap if, blend, and the small cap value ETFs. Yeah, so if you if you went if you went there, you'd get uh, for a uh, large cap blend. Um, we have there's there's a little bit of an exception, and I'll yeah, come back in to the article it. Article you guys used uh, the S and I guess we presented the Vanguard version of them and the Fidelity as well. So in the article itself, we had the uh, the Vanguard uh, 500 fund, and then the Fidelity equivalent um, on the S and P 500 side. On the large value, we had again the Vanguard and Fidelity ones, uh, V V I A X and F L C O X. On the small blend, on the Vanguard side, we had the VSMAX, and the Fidelity side, the FSSNX, and for small value, VSIAX, and for Fidelity, FISVX. And again, members of the association, it's, it's our, available on our website. You can download that article. And what we'll do tomorrow is anybody who signed up for the webinar, we'll send out uh, a link to this broadcast a link to the slides, and we'll be sure to put in any kind of notes, including a link to the September article that uh, Paul wrote, and uh, as well as anything that Chris has written in the past as well. So it's uh, we'll get a reference to all the articles and, and then information about the upcoming webinar as well. Thanks, John. Be here. Any uh, thoughts about value investing versus index ETF investing? Well, value investing is an asset class, and an ETF is a bucket you could own that in. You could own it in an ETF. You could own it in a mutual fund. Um, or you could do it with a set of stocks, right? There's a lot of different or, yeah. ways to do it. You yeah. could create uh, in one of these uh, uh, platforms your own group of, of, of value issues if you wanted to. Um, so the key is to come up with an asset allocation you want and then find the best instruments basically to Look, build that allocation. Here's, here's the thing. Uh, Chris has taken the time and he updates this. He'll be updating it after the first of the year. He has gone through all the ETFs in each of those asset classes and he has tested them for all the things that he's looking for to make them the best ETF to 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 actually capture what he wants or what we want 
out of these asset classes. Now, having said that, that means that we have chosen to select small cap value that is truly small and actually smaller than some so-called small cap value that are almost right. mid cap value. So what could happen here, and this is this problem with people being impatient, is in a market that large outperforms small, larger small cap value is probably going to make more money than smaller small cap value. And so it's important to understand that Chris's picks are not guessing what kind of small cap value, the larger or the smaller small cap value, or the more deeply discounted, but to find the ones that he thinks are going to work best for the long term. And so we get, in fact, I just had a, a, somebody wrote and said, how come you're recommending a small cap value when I would make more money if I had put my money in the small cap blend Vanguard fund? Well, be, he's asking that because the small cap blend has done better than the small cap value lately. And I said, well, because the small cap blend is not a small cap value fund. And that's confusing to people because there's still, you talk about, about young people, the focus on, on getting rewards now is such a big deal. I, I got a wonderful email, somebody thanking me profusely who, who saw me speak. I, I have a class up at Western Washington University that our foundation sponsors, and I go up once a quarter and I teach one of the classes. And he remembered me fondly. And, and I, I thought, gee, this is great. And then he went on to tell me he had put his only $10,000 he had to invest in a high-tech stock for 85 cents a share. And uh, I didn't know the company, except that this company had been worth over $110 uh, a few years ago. Uh, and must have had something very exciting in their life, which is now, for some reason, proven not to be so exciting. So on top of everything, he was doing everything wrong. He bought a penny stock, put everything in one stock, and I wanted to go shoot myself. Instead, I just smiled inside and thought, this is what evidently some kids have got to go through. We don't want them to do that. We want them to do the smart thing from day one. But Wall Street, and I don't mean all of Wall Street, but the the allure of the big hit, the allure of retiring young because you might get in on the ground floor. Well, he was getting in on the ground floor possibly, but the wrong end of the ground floor at the end of its excitement rather than the beginning. And yet he took my class. What is going on there? What did we do wrong? So we're, we're, we're running a little bit late on time here. So uh, let's, uh, if you could close on one question here. Um, what guidelines uh, do you have for rebalancing as far as frequency? Uh, you wanna take it, Daryl? Well, there are a number of different ways you can you can rebalance. Um, I know I know Paul, or I believe Paul, does it strictly on a on an annual basis, same day every year. Just looks at it, sees what's out of whack, fixes it, and moves on. Um, we, myself, my wife, and I, we use five percent bands. We use Larry Swedrow's five twenty five approach. Uh, we check it. We check it once a year. Um, so we have sometimes twice a year. Uh, we check it, and if it's out of whack out of those bands, we bring it back to the to the bands, be within the bands. Um, I know other people do it on a on a uh, more they more or less uh, frequent basis. Um, I don't remember what you do, Chris. Uh, we we do I'd just call it patient, you know, like every year or two. And I, I've done a yeah. lot of um, I've done a lot of analysis where I've gone and looked at what happens if you rebalance monthly, what happens if you rebalance right. yearly, and the the changes are pretty subtle. It it's right. uh, it's not dramatic, and so uh, we're just we're pretty patient about it. Yep. It I, is and I do it when I'm calm. <laughs> when you're calm, that's good. It's like, you know. Yeah. 
just I'd add one thing. If you, it's not good to rebalance too often. Uh, yes. What it does, yeah. it reduces your risk because you tend to move money from the the the, the high powered stocks into the low powered holdings, uh, typically, and uh, and 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 it re and it will likely reduce r return, but you will reduce risk. And uh, I think let the let those winners go for a while. Sure. Uh, we've guess, even looked at the possibility of not rebalancing. So, but having probably a system in place is the most important thing. Determine in yes. advance what's going to be your right. trigger, and don't let your emotions determine the balancing part. But really, let your model determine that. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, a lot of great questions, and we'll do our best to answer those uh, via great. email. I think you guys are going to handle that, um, and uh, we'll get those to you. Uh, we'll get those to the gentleman here tomorrow, and. Uh, Ryan, please take it away. Sure, absolutely. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the panelists tonight uh, for a great presentation. Uh, probably, uh, I would say, our uh, most well-attended presentation um, so far. Um, we do have a num number of other uh, great upcoming webinars, um, if you're interested. Uh, the website is www.aaii.com slash webinars to register for any of these uh, fine uh, webinar Wednesdays that we do. Uh, next week, we are featuring uh, AAII journal editor Charles Ropeblatt. Uh, who will give us an update on the AAII Way project, uh, which is a uh, plan he's, he's developing along with the community here um, to uh, develop your own personal investing plan. Uh, check that out next week at uh, 7.30 p.m. Uh, the following week, uh, we will be rebroadcasting a, a webinar we did with Craig Israelson on uh, retirement portfolio analysis, a multi-decade review. Uh, check that out on uh, October 7th at 7.30. Uh, the week after, uh, we will be hosting uh, Mabane Faber, uh, whose uh, webinar is called The uh, Tale of Two Tales, Strategies for Up and Down Markets. Uh, you won't want to miss that. That is October 14th, again, at 730 Central. And uh, Chris uh, Pedersen, who was uh, on, on our panel tonight, uh, will be hosting a follow-up webinar uh, to this one called uh, Simple and Effective Balanced Portfolios for Lifetime Investing Success. Uh, I believe he will be uh, detailing uh, his uh, the two fund uh, uh, stuff that they were talking about uh, this evening. Uh, that will be at the end of October, October 21st, uh, 7.30 Central. Uh, again, uh, please register at uh, www.aaii.com slash webinars. These are free and uh, we invite you to participate. Uh, we did record this webinar and uh, that link will be uh, posted uh, on uh, this website as well and sent to your email address uh, when it becomes available. Uh, with that, uh, thanks so much for everybody for uh, joining us tonight. Thank and, you, Ryan. Uh, thank thank you. you. And uh, we wish you, we wish you all uh, good health and good wealth. Good night. Thank you. Good, good night. night.